Can you see that? <laughs> Is that ever beautiful? Wow. It's not often that the wind, there is no wind on the lake at all. And uh, wow, I'm just, I'm just blown away here. So it's the middle of November. It's minus six degrees Celsius. There's not a breeze as you can see by the lake. The sky is perfectly clear. I can't think of a better day to be in the woods. And then when I got down here to the edge of the lake, like I said, I was just blown away. So my plan today is to hike into an area of the wilderness that I haven't been in probably two or three years. Even at that, I've only been there once or twice, just to see what's there. If I recall correctly, there's a lot of stands of hardwood. I do have to do some uphill climbing, but I think it may be worth it. I don't recall if there's a water source, so I brought a couple of liters of water with me. I have some new gear that I want to show you. I have some new leather work from a fellow by the name of Al Ainsworth. I have a new stove that came in from Germany that I'm still testing, so this won't be a review, but I think you'll be interested to see it. And I'm going to sit down and enjoy a Happy Yak meal and some Rampage coffee. If you're interested, follow along. For me, this is what it's all about. If I didn't get any further into the woods today, I'd be happy just to sit here on this rock, with the sun on my back, a cup of coffee, and just enjoy the view. Look at this cool little phenomenon. I believe they're called ice flowers. I wonder if I can get some more sunlight on it. When the moisture in the earth is suddenly driven up by the cold temperatures and there's still warmth underneath it, forcing it up, this is what you get. You'd almost think it was some type of mushroom, but no, it's ice. So I've come across my crossroads. This is where I'll diverge and take the path less traveled. Normally, when I come into the wilderness, I follow in that direction. You may be able to make out the rudimentaries of a trail. That takes me further north into the wilderness, but today I'm gonna to be going west. And this trail is a bit more obvious right here. Anyway, it does peter out. I know that this trail does go up at least to the power lines a kilometer or so up over the hill here but I also know that there are trails off of that that lead to well I don't know I guess that's the reason I'm going up to see where some of those trails lead to so this is the woods I'm in now I uh, was on a trail that did lead up to the power lines and then I found one that kind of led back into the woods and of course that's what this day was all about was some exploring so here are the woods, but uh, coming along I found something rather interesting. Actually, very interesting to me. Look at the size of this mushroom. Now it's old, and it's full of holes on top, so it's uh, not in any way fresh. Although, when you look underneath, let's see if I can get down and show you underneath. Still looks pretty good under there. But on other spots on the log, I found a few that were in better shape. Smaller. I picked them off because I'm taking these ones home. Here's a small one that I picked off, although it's still a pretty good size. And this rather large beauty. Yep. I'm 99.9% .9 sure that I have the artist conch, or Ganoderma aplanatum. I'll go home and confirm, but I'm, I'm almost absolutely positive. If I am, this is a very medicinal mushroom. Ranks up there close with Rishi. I think we're on a big old dead oak. That's what it looks like to me. So sometimes taking the pathless traveled or doing a little bushwhacking actually pays off. There was no path where I'm at now, or leading into where I'm at now, but I pushed through because I was just looking for a place to sit down that might be in the sun or near. And I came into this little opening, and lo and behold, 
nice little campsite somebody has. You know, I've been all around this over the years and just never found this. Can't believe how open it is right here and how nice a spot it is. Boy, somebody's got a little bit of skill. Nice tripod, properly lashed up. That looks like something I'd do. Well, more bank line used than I would use. A little table. Place to sit. Access to the water. Some firewood. I won't use theirs. I'll find some of my own and maybe even add to their pile. I'm going to have to remember this place. This is about as nice a spot as I have found within walking distance anywhere here in the wilderness. Alright, I'm going to take a few minutes to get my setup made and sit down and make some lunch. Alright, so I moved back from that little campfire spot where the tripod was <coughs> just a, a little distance. I wanted to get a little further back from the lake because there was a breeze starting to pick up on the lake and uh, I just wanted to be able to record. Plus I wanted to be able to sit in the sun. Now the funny thing is I laid everything out where I'm at and the sun has moved. Go figure. So, but I can see it coming through the trees, so the sun will be on me again in a few minutes time. So, do you know you forget just how much more work it is to do something like set up a camp, have a lunch, when it's cold? Uh, and film a video. Uh, that's probably the complicating factor. If you're just sitting down, lighting up a stove and putting a kettle on, maybe it's not as, that much work. But when you're trying to get the right angles for the, for the camera, make sure you can get picked up by the microphone. Uh, hopefully I'm being picked up by the microphone right now. Uh, it's a little bit more work. So I'm sitting down and I'm now I'm ready to have some lunch. Actually, I'm really ready to have some lunch. You may have seen this before, what I'm sitting on. It is a mat that I made for myself. It has a waterproof covering on the bottom. It has a wool blanket on top and in between it has Reflectex from a, a windshield you know cover that keeps the sun out of the wind or out of the windshield to keep your car cool in the summertime I guess. Windshield reflector? Is that the right word? Uh, I'm gonna make one of these on video from uh, one of those wool blanket projects that I started last year and uh, so I have some, some of that wool blanket left, so I will show you how this is made, or at least how you can make one yourself, maybe not identical to this. But right now, it's time to get some lunch on. So, I have my stove. It's called the Brunel, or Brunelli, Brunelli, I guess, stove from Germany. And like I said before, it's not going to be a review, but I will give you a little bit of a, a show and tell on it anyway. So it is a stainless steel flat folding stove. As you can see, it is extremely light. Oh, it smokes this light. How light is it? How about seven ounces? Yeah, seven ounces. Seven ounces. Cross stands are what hold it together and it just springs into shape. There is a grill setting up off of the bottom for airflow and another one underneath that for, uh, to protect the earth from the soil, or earth from any hot coals dropping through. I've had, what, six, seven fires in it so far? And when I got it, I, I was a little concerned, you know, it's a spring stainless steel, I was a little concerned that it wouldn't stand up to the heat, but uh, absolutely amazing, so far, so far. One thing I have noticed about it is you do have to be careful of the surface you're putting it on, not just because the heat will still transfer through the bottom, but because it's taller than it is wide, meaning it can be a little tippy, especially when I put the uh, uh, cross stands on. So, what I've started bringing out with me, and it's, it's a good thing to use anyway for small wood stoves, this is the bottom of one of those spring form cake pans that you can buy. I picked this up at, at Value Village, the whole thing for, I don't know, $2. And this piece here is just a featherweight, but what an ideal thing to put on the ground to set the stove on for balance and protect the earth just that much more. Now let me see if I can find a half decent spot for it. That'll work right there. Cross stands will go on top, but first I have to build up my little bit of a fire inside. 
Birch bark, of course. Smalls, just load it. I'm just doing a bottom up burn this time. Fast, that way I guess. Very chaotic load of wood. That's enough to get some things going there. Now, get this birch bark lit up. Got my glasses, yeah. So you may have noticed that I'm wearing a blaze orange or hunter's hat toque today. The area of the wilderness I'm in, well the wilderness is open. I mean, you're allowed to hunt here. I haven't come across any hunters recently. I have in the past, but not recently. So I'm not too concerned with running across hunters, but I needed something for my... keep my head warm, so why not a... blaze orange toque? How am I going to light you? Just shove it in top, I guess. I don't know. There we go. That's better. You can light. There we go. That's better. Well, that wasn't very professional, was it? Could have done a better job of that. But, in it goes. Airflow in this stove is amazing. Perfectly designed so far. All right, where to put my cross stand? One of the things I like about the cross stand, it has to be an inch and a half tall. And as a result, uh, the air, the exhaust area for the for the uh, flames and the smoke at the top is quite tremendous, and you can feed wood while the stove was with the pot on top. Got to give that another second or two to catch, and then I'll put the stove on or the pot on. So it's catching. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I've got a few things I have to do, such as get my lunch ready while this is catching on, and then I'll put the pot on, and and uh, I'll bring you back. Lunch today. Another happy yak meal. Put my spoon forks in there. It is good. Today it's creamy chicken fusilis. Bring it up to the camera. Creamy chicken fusilis. Those are the instructions. So the instructions for this one are 400 mils of water, 12 to 15 minutes. in the uh, right okay 400 mils of water 12 to 15 minutes resting time let's open this up so what I'm going to do is things just a little bit different today oh, my kettle's boiling good I brought something now I wouldn't normally carry this out hiking because of the size but it's something I found at Value Village and it was brand new it's a Stanley, what size is this? 32 ounce double wall bowl. Stainless steel bowl. Pretty cold on the inside right now. But uh, figure what an ideal thing to mix my lunch up in. And then I can let it rehydrate right in 
Ah, they, oh, wow. I know I've said this before, but holy smokes. And that chicken. It's all a piece of chicken, big pieces of chicken. All right, so what ended up happening, of course, is all the noodles are at the bottom, so that buried all the chicken and broccoli and everything else. So let's see if I can stir it a little bit of it to the top. That's impressive. Okay. Let's see. Chicken, big chunks of chicken, chunks of chicken, not little cubes. Broccoli, big chunks of broccoli. Of course, the fusilli noodles and the soup base did all stay at the bottom. Those are the primary ingredients as well as the spices and everything else. I won't, uh, I won't bore you with reading the label. I'll put a link to the spot on the Happy Yak site where this can be found. So now that my water is hot, it is hot isn't it? Boiling away. That can't get any hotter than that. I will put in, and this is going to end up being a guesstimation today for how much I'm putting in, but 400 mils, that's not, that's, uh, not quite two cups. So what I'm thinking is just enough to cover it. Make sure everything is mixed in, all the soup ingredients. Maybe I'll just put a touch more water in. Yeah, it's probably closer to two cups instead of 400 mils. Put the lid on. And because it's cold enough, snug fit, I'll put it inside of my insulated lunch bag. Take everything else out. Perfect. I'll set that aside. And what else could I be doing right now? I suppose I could be putting on for water, more water for coffee. But I think in the meantime what I'll do is I'll reposition the camera and I'll show you what else I brought with me. Okay, so what else did I bring along today that I wanted to share with you? Well, here's a small thing and I, I show you this because it might be something you want to do yourself if you can get a hold of this piece. So. The saw that I'm using today, okay, I picked up at Lee Valley here in Canada, uh, the blank, just the, bl just the blade itself. It came with a pair of bolts and uh, it was really cheap. I don't know if they were clearing the motor or not, but it was like $10, $12 for the saw. It's made in Korea, I believe. I've covered up the, where the, uh, the maker is, but the Lee Valley branding is right on the bottom there. So I'm not sure if you can still buy them. The reason I picked it up, one, was because it was so cheap, and two, I've been thinking about buying one of the Silky Zubats. Not so much to replace my Gomboy, but uh, just as something different, uh, maybe with a little bit more longer stroke on it for cutting bigger wood. And I thought, you know, if I can get on with this, then maybe I could, uh, you know, appreciate that. So I did have to make the handle, which is just a piece of oak that I, drew a pattern on a little piece of oak that I had, cut it out with a bandsaw, sanded it down, put a little bit of stain on it, and it fits my hand. And I've been playing with this for a little bit of while. I've, you know, I've got some movement to room to move on the handle, playing with a little, little bit of time. And there is something to be said for that curvature in that blade. Let me tell you, it really pulls through wood. Again, it's still a pull saw, so, you know, will it cut on the, on the push? Well, I don't really know because that's not the habit I want to get into. It's very thin, very flexible. And like my Gomboy, I think it may be prone to bending if you start pushing on the blade. So the pull stroke is what really makes this uh, effective. So that's what I used to pick up a little bit of wood today for my fire. Now, one of the reasons I came out was to share with you something that was sent to me by a gentleman by the name of Al Ainsworth. And he's in Australia. And how I came to have this is probably two years ago. Al, you can correct me, but I think it's probably at least two years ago. Al put out a call on, the, on YouTube 
for anybody that might be interested in receiving for free some of his leather work with the understanding that they would eventually show it on their YouTube channel. Now, at the time that uh, I responded to Al, I had about a thousand subscribers. Now I'm just closing in on 11,000. I will before the end of this year close in 11,000 subscribers. It did take a while for Al and I to connect up and have this sent to me. And when it arrived, it was summertime. So this is the type of thing that you would wear on the outside of your jacket. And since now I'm getting into the winter where I wear my army coat, or my army jacket, I guess, this, this wool one, um, I figured it was a good time to bring it out. So what did Al send me? Well, he sent me a small combination of things. First off is this heavy, heavy grade leather belt, veg tan leather. It's uh, you know wide and thick and long too. Al, this is long. It's all riveted with copper rivets through here. Heavy duty brass double buckle here. Uh, this is a, I'd call it a lifetime item but it's something that it's a heritage item you're going to be passing this down to your kids and they'll be passing it down to their kids i'm sure so you know it's just top top quality there's nothing fancy about this there's no basket weave or anything else it's just good solid thick leather something that's not going to wear out something that's just going to last forever that's that's probably the best thing i could say about it so along with that i'll send a few things i'm going to take them right off of the belt so you can see them individually okay one of the things he sent me was a knife sheath and the knife sheath is intended he fitted this one out for a mora clipper well i didn't have a clipper but i do have or a companion i should say i have the companion hd the the heavy duty version so i uh, it is slightly bigger than the regular size companion so it took a little bit of stretching to get it in the sheath, but it fits in nicely. Again, super high quality, hard leather. I'm not quite sure how he treated it, but it's, it's as hard as Kydex. There's no flex to the leather at all. So it, it could have been dipped in beeswax. Al, you can chime in if you'd like and uh, correct me on that. Heavy duty stitching all down the welt. Thick welt on it. Nice belt loop on it. Very thick. Uh, I've been wearing it for a while now and like I said, it's just, it hasn't shown any wear whatsoever. What else came with that? Uh, a pouch that was intended for one of my Swiss Army knives, but uh, the one that I have is too big for this pouch. It's, it's a you know, small pouch for uh, a folding knife. Primarily, Al said it would fit up to a Buck 110 model. Um, I, did, I, I wanted to carry something else in it, and I didn't have a Swiss Army knife, so I put one of my Leatherman in. It took my Leatherman just nicely inside. So again, the same heavy duty stitching. Belt buckle or belt loop on it. Same hard texture surface to the as it has with the, the knife sheath. What else did he send me? Where did I just lay that? Right here. So an axe loop, sometimes called a frog, I understand. So this is something that I can drop an axe through and carry it on my belt. I didn't bring an axe out with me today. I had enough with me. I decided not to bring an axe. I wasn't going to do that much wood processing. But this goes on the belt and you can carry. Now, I did try a couple of my axes and this is meant more for a smaller axe, uh, maybe even a hatchet or so, yeah, a hatchet or even a tomahawk, this loop anyway. So because it's just not big enough for my bigger axes like my uh, Holtaforce wouldn't fit down through there. He sent an axe mask and this one will fit a couple of my axes, my one of a couple of my hatches and my Hultafors. And he left the <laughs> the uh, loop really long on it. Actually there was another loop on it when he sent it and it was too short to, for the work so I'll put another uh, belt buckle loop in the mail. What was nice is it's attached to the mask with a brass Chicago screw. So it was easy enough to take the other one off and put this one on. And on the other side is the brass buckle with copper rivet. And it'll feed through. And when I decide which one I'm going to leave, which axe I'm going to leave it on, I'll be able to cut the excess strapping off. Again, heavy welt. Same type of construction that's on the other two items. 
And yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put the information where you can contact Al in the show notes below. He has an ST store and he goes by the Howling Dingo. He has a YouTube channel as well. And I'll, I'll make sure that's on, on the, the show notes or probably right in, the, right in the video here somewhere. You'll see a link to Al's YouTube channel. Al, this is not his full-time work, but he does supplement his income with leather work, and he has, he does some pretty exotic things with uh, emu and uh, kangaroo leather and a few other things like that. I think that's kind of neat. I'll let you contact Al to talk about custom pieces made. He does have a few standard pieces that he lists on his SD store, but you can reach out to him and see what, uh, what he can make for you. Okay. I think it's been about 10 minutes. I still have a few minutes. I'm going to have to put my kettle back on for a coffee. Fingers are cold. The things you forget about over the summer. Once I stopped moving, the first thing I did is, is well, while I was moving, I, I stripped down. I took the wool coat off, and I got down to a base layer and a mid layer. And then, of course, when I got here, I put the wool coat back on. Then, as I sat for a few minutes, I discovered it was cooler than I thought. I ended up putting my back up, which is a very thin down jacket on underneath. Now, I'm quite comfortable, except for my fingers being cold but I'm quite comfortable sitting here back in the woods out of the wind a little ways. I think it's time to have some lunch and then coffee. You know, having something to sit on on the ground, bigger than just a little sit pad, uh, is a wonderful thing. You can stretch out like I have here. I have another little piece of what was an old barbecue cover that I, that I cut into a square, probably uh, 24 by 20 inches. That's just something I can lay all my stuff on without having to worry about it either getting lost or getting wet. It's just to give us a little protection, a little bit of organization on the ground here. But having this wool Reflectix nylon mat to sit on is just wonderful. No cold butt, comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, lunch is ready, or should be. Let's check it out. So I have it in this dollar store lunch bag inside of a Stanley 32 ounce stainless steel double wall bowl that I picked up at Value Village. I'm not sure what they're worth new. I should look into it because uh, this, oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs> you know, I saw recently where Canadian Prepper did a review on Happy Yak Meals and he calls them the best survival food available. And uh, <laughs> survival food or not, they're just good food. I probably say this every time, but uh, the best freeze-dried meals that I have ever tasted. Now, I haven't tasted all of them, but I've tasted some of the more common ones, and this beats it out. Oh, look, wow. Let's taste test is what it's all about. So we have chicken, fusilli, broccoli, herbs, spices, and whatever the base is. It, came, it gave it a nice... Cre Actually, why don't I show you? Bring it in a little closer. A nice creamy sauce on it. Mmm. Mmm. Okay. Everything is perfectly, perfectly rehydrated. I'm actually kind of glad I put in that just that little bit of extra water. Probably closer to 500 mils than the 400 that was recommended. Mmm. I think Canadian Prepper said it as well, and I've been saying it as I taste these meals. They're not, I repeat, not salty. I actually brought my little spice pack. Now, before I do anything to it, let me describe it to you. Creamy base, very chickeny, lots of chicken. Not just a few little pieces of chicken just so they can say there's chicken in it, but lots of chicken, lots of broccoli in good sized pieces. There's a herb to it. It's not a strong flavor, but it is just a nice creamy flavor. What am I going to do to it? Garlic. Oh, here's my little spice kit. It's just a little pouch, probably a little change purse, nothing fancy. Some little bottles from the dollar store. I haven't really made a video on this or anything because nothing special, just a few spices. So I'm adding a little garlic powder. Does it need it? doesn't need it, but uh, I'm just 
put in a suiting it to my taste. And I am going to put a little bit of salt in it. Not much. Just a little shake. Do I want to add heat? What have I got for heat? Hot sauce, no. The spicy Montreal, Montreal steak spicy, the spicy version. Come to love that. I use it all the time at home, use it all the time in the woods. Has some flakes of hot pepper and things in it. Okay, that's all I'm going to put in it. My spice kit aside. The bowl is actually cold to the touch on the outside, but the meal is hot inside. Mmm, very hot. Oh, that's, that's wonderful, folks. I think this ranks right up there. I think one of my most favorite meals from Happy Yak so far has been the Pad Thai. It's the one that Steffi and I shared in a, a hike a few weeks ago when we took her puppy Ruby out. If you haven't seen that, I'll put a link up here in the corner somewhere where you can... Or is it that way? One of these corners where you can watch that video. That's the last time I've actually been out for a hike where I made it. I've been out for a few more hikes, but where I actually come, had a camera with me. And uh, that pad thai was oh, just right at the top of my list of favorites. This is pretty close. I can recommend this for sure. Okay, rather than make you watch me eat this, let me finish this meal off, and then it'll be coffee time. All right, well, it is coffee time, and uh, I have to relight my stove. So here's my kettle. My kettle is here. Some blocks of pine. And inside the stove, I put a few smalls. This time, I put the birch bark right down inside. I usually don't like doing that. It, I, you know, I'm always afraid I'm going to knock the stove over. But let's see if I can't redeem myself on, uh, from that amateurish lighting job I did for my lunch. Yep. For this one, what I'll do is I'll try and hold the knife still and pull the ferro rod back. That way there's not less of a chance of me striking the top of the stove. Not my... favorite way of doing it because it's a little less controlled the direction that the sparks or the sparks will go but it does work now I haven't said too much about the stove other than the fact that it, it works very well it also came with a couple of accessories I'm not going to show them in this video because that'll be part of the review but there's a drop-in plate that will accept the Trangia burner the alcohol version, as well as the gas version, as well as a Primus stove. And on the side, probably can't see it right here, are cutouts designed for the feed to go in so you can have the tank on the outside. There's also another plate designed for use with Esbet. And uh, I haven't tried the Esbet yet, but the Esbet should... Uh, well, I'll try it, obviously. I'm going to try it. I'm not a big fan of Esbet. You've probably heard me say that in the past. To me, one of the highlights is this pot stand. You can see how tall it sits off of, the, off of the stove itself. This is well designed for airflow. It does go through wood quickly, but it works, you know, it just, it's just a, a really good working, well designed, as far as airflow goes, type of stove. All right, things are starting to catch. It'll take a few minutes before uh, this water comes to a boil. I have a, just enough water in there for my coffee and maybe a little bit to clean up my bowl with afterwards. Ooh, I think I put some big pieces in. It's a little slow on the go. Did it go out? No, it's still going. Hissing. Hissing means wet. Well, it didn't take much to bring it back, though. Wet wood. Didn't feel wet. All 
I'm going to be smoky tonight. Oh, it's going to go. It's going to go. Just a little reluctant. While that catches on, now I can start to get my coffee ready. So I think what I'll do is I'll just reposition the camera so I can grind up some coffee. And we're going to be using the AeroPress today. Okay, so I got the stove lit. But the wood was either cold or damp. Just, it's going. It's just going slowly. All right. Coffee. Take my gloves off for this, I guess. Something else I usually don't carry when I come out is an insulated steel mug. I usually have my Cooksa, either my homemade one or my Kupilka, the one that's made with plasticized wood, or the Uber Lieben one. But in the wintertime, it's nice to have a double wall mug to keep your coffee or hot chocolate or tea warmer that much longer with a sippy lid and the Rampage sticker on it because that is what I'm having today. All right. So in this bag is my coffee maker, coffee filters, my AeroPress. You know, one of my recent videos I showed using the AeroPress and somebody said, uh, we're grinding coffee for the AeroPress. They said, don't bother carrying the bottom of the press, just or the coffee grinder, just carry the top and it will drop down inside the AeroPress. They're absolutely right. And I've done that in the past. But most of the time I carry two pieces together because I'm not always carrying the AeroPress. It's my favorite, but it's not something I, it's not the only one I carry. But today I thought just to show that, uh, that's what I would do. So, what else am I going to do? I'm going to get the press ready. So, I carry paper filters and a stainless steel filter. I think I've shown it before. But for an AeroPress, there's just these tiny little paper filters. Oh, it's two of them. There's one. Tiny little paper filters. And if I'm having a wood fire, this can go right into the wood fire afterwards. But on occasion, I'll use this stainless steel filter that I have for it. Very, very fine holes. That aside, if fire's going well now, the filter go, and I know I've shown this before, the filter goes in the lid. At home when I'm doing this, I'll, I'll run tap water through it just to get rid of any paper taste, but there's so little filter here. How much paper taste can you actually get into the coffee? That goes on to the end. So, there are two ways of using the AeroPress. The standard way, the way in which it was designed to be used, was to set it down over top of the cup, put the coffee, then the hot water in, and then put the plunger on, wait just 30 seconds, and start plunging down. The other way, and this seems to be what a lot of people, and I usually like myself, although I've learned a trick I'm going to try today, I haven't actually done this before, which is... They call it the inverted method. And that's where you would start using it, where you'd set it up the same way, but now it's upside down. So the coffee and the water will go in, you let it set, the filter goes on top, let it set for a period of time, and then turn it over your cup and push it down. So I'm gonna try something new today. I watched a coffee expert show me on YouTube. But first I gotta grind some coffee. So the coffee I am using today or having today, oh my kettle's boiling, good, is the Code Black from Rampage Coffee and I have enough for two cups. I'm trying to get half of that into the grinder without spilling any of these precious beans which I am doing. That's better. It's a nice thing about having this blanket here. The beans are falling on the blanket, so I can just pick them up and put them right in my grinder. All right, where did the lid go? So now, 
I can grind right into the AeroPress. Instead of putting it in the bottom of the grinder and then dumping it in. It goes in directly. So I'll uh, grind that up because it's going to take a few minutes and then I'll bring it back. All right, coffee's ground. So what is this trick? It's not really a trick, it's just a, a way that uh, people have developed over time. It was new to me, so that's why I share it as a trick. And it just m makes sense when you try it. So my water is hot, but it has stopped bubbling, so ideally your water should be below boiling. If water boils at 212, ideally you want your water at 190 to 200. You know, if you just take it off, even for a minute, it's plenty cold, or plenty hot, but just the right temperature. So I am going to fill, I find it helps to stabilize this, fill this pretty much up right up to the top, give it a quick stir, make sure all the coffee has been wetted. And the trick, because it's, the reason is, right now, coffee, if I can try and show you this, coffee is running through all by itself. I want to slow that coffee down. So the trick is, without the pine needles, put the plunger in at an angle, put it down, and then pull it up a little bit. When you pull it back up, it creates a vacuum and stops the dripping. Now I can let it sit for however long I want without any more of the coffee running through the AeroPress. Not revolutionary, but a good little trick. The reason why is this is just a little bit more stable. I'm less likely to spill my coffee than I am if I have the whole unit turned upside down. Now, the professionals say start pushing almost right away. How fast? They have times on, I don't know, I just push. I don't force it, I just let it fall under its own weight until I hear the air hiss in the bottom, and it's done. Now, that's a strong, strong cup of coffee. You can either drink it just like this, uh, which I think is exactly what I'm going to do, or you can add a little bit more water to it. That's almost espresso strength. If you add a little bit more water, I guess it would be called an Americano. Okay. Now, with my insulated cup, I can take the time to set this down, reposition myself without worrying about uh, my coffee getting cold. This is what it's all about. I came down to the edge of the lake to enjoy some of my coffee. It's in a nice little cove here. Wish I'd known about this spot before. I'm hoping that the people who made this area, or this clearing here and little setup that they have, aren't going to be coming all winter. I mean, it's their spot. It, this is still wilderness. It's, we all can share it. But I'd like to be able to come back here because it's further into the woods than I go often. But, you know, an hour, an hour and a half, and I'm here, and it's a nice sheltered little spot. I don't, it's in a cove, as I said, so I don't get all the force of the, the north wind as it comes down the lake. There's resources here. I'll have to make, be careful not to strip all the trees around here. There's dead trees, but it looks like a lot of it's been harvested, so I'm going to have to go a little further to get dead wood. But that's okay. You know, all I need is a couple of pieces each time, especially if I'm using small stick stoves. The sun is just at the top of the trees. 3.30 in the afternoon. Hour and a half to hike out. I have just enough time to enjoy this cup of coffee, pack my gear up, and hit the trail before it starts to get really dark in the woods. It's November, right? But I also start packing things like headlamps and tarps this time of year because you never know, right? You never know. Extra warm clothing. All things that you should have when you're out on a day like this, just in case.
Okay, this Rampage coffee is just bringing new life back into me. Oh, that's nice. So I'm going to enjoy this. I'll pack up. We're going to hit the trail, but I am going to hopefully be able to show you a few things before I close out this video. So this is what a good day in the woods is all about. In late afternoon I have, let's see, ooh, half hour before sunset, so uh, just about enough time to get out of the woods. It gets dark in the woods sooner than that, but uh, you know, probably just enough time to get out of the woods. I still have 45 minutes or so to hike, and I noticed my battery's dying, so <laughs> I thought just in case I don't get to record an ending any later, I should record it now. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I shared a few new things with you, nothing in great detail. I had a wonderful Happy Yak lunch and a wonderful cup of Rampage coffee. Can't ask for any more than that. And the scenery, man, this is a great time of the year. If you are wondering if you should get into the woods in the winter, the answer is, what else are you going to do? Stay at home? You may as well get out there and enjoy it. Embrace it, my daughter would say. Get equipped, get geared up. It does take more gear, it does take a bit more planning. The days are shorter, so you got to start earlier, but you just can't beat this. This is just perfect. Not a, not a breath of air, not a sound to be had, just the birds, the squirrels, and the smells of a fall forest. Okay, that's enough, isn't it? I ended up on a path that I had not expected to end up on. I guess that's what it was all about. I had taken the, the path that veered off to the west and followed it, but it's not the one I thought I was going to be going on. I'm not sure where that is. That's what I'll have to do. I'll have to come back at some point and explore a little further. But it was great just the same because where it came around, it ended up making a big loop, I guess, and then back onto the trail that I had veered off of. And as a result, I found that cool little spot to camp on or to have coffee on today. I guess if I hadn't taken the path I had, I wouldn't have found that. So, successful? Yes. What I thought it was going to be? No, but successful nonetheless. Okay, folks, that's all I have for you. I'm glad. I hope you enjoyed this video. And until next time, get out and explore and take that path less travel, because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.